welcome for uh, to everybody. It's nice um, to see you again, and it's also nice that most of you are sharing the screen with us. I think it always makes it nicer actually to talk. Um, my name is Petra Dunnecker. I'm um, a key researcher at the platform, and I'm from the Development Studies Department of, of Vienna University. And it's my honor actually to moderate today's keynote given by Peter Eddy, um, who is a geographer and scholar of mobilities. His work lies at the intersection between space security and mobility. He teaches at the Royal Holloway University of London, where he also leads a master program in geopolitics and security. And he was also a former chair of the Social and Cultural Geography Research Group, which is one of the last largest research groups of the Royal Geographical Society, which I have learned. Um, much of his work um, revolved around the so-called mobility, new mobility paradigm. I think we are all familiar, or we have all looked into the book Mobility, which was um, which he published in 2009 and in a second edition in 2017. I think it's a very clear and comprehensive introduction of mobility studies, discussing key concepts, topic and interesting cases. And I think it helped us all to give a kind of overview. He also co-edited the Handbook of Mobilities in 2014. He's an editor, co-editor of Changing of the Changing Mobilities book series and the co-editor of the Journal of Mobilities. And when we look at his direct research interest, um, they center around a number of intertwined empirical and conceptual sites of inquiry, uh, its military geographies, emergencies and evacuation and the matter of air. And I don't want to name all publications, I think, Whoever is interested is, of course, invited to look it up. He's currently working on a book project based on his research on emergency and evacuation entitled The Way We Evacuate for Duke University Press. And I just came across an article lately on Shu towards a promiscuous politics of emergency evacuation mobility, which was published in Society and Space last year, which I really enjoyed reading, I have to say. I thought it was a great piece of scientific work and um, very fascinating to read. Um, this evening, he will, the title of his presentation is Fire Escape, Mobilities, Gender and Gen um, genialities of high-rise evacuation. And I think I and everybody in this room is looking forward to your presentation. And uh, I would propose that if you have questions, please write it down and we do it after your presentation. The idea was to give you 40 to 50 minutes and then we will have 30 minutes for discussion. And it would be really great um, also probably for you, Peter, as well, to get feedback and questions and to discuss some issues further. So thanks for joining. Thanks for being here this evening and um, have the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks, Petra, for that lovely introduction. That's really kind, thank you. Uh, and thanks also to the Daniela and the, the conference team for putting this together. I'm really grateful for the invite. I really wish we were all in the same place. Um, together. But anyway, uh, so there's a kind of alternative title to this paper that I sort of put in the title, I've slipped in there, it's called Fool Girl, and hopefully this will become a bit obvious what I mean by that uh, as we go, and, but also some of the sort of, the, I guess, ambiguity over that, uh, over that term. And, um, and by the way, this is also just the background image is an image of a fire escape shoot drill at my own institution, uh, which was a women's college and it's dated 1928. Okay, so in 2013, the eight-story Rana Plaza garment factory collapsed in Dhaka, killing over 1,100 people. 
The disaster happened less than a year after the Tazreen fire on the outskirts of Dhaka in Ashulia dis district. The Tazreen fire had seen workers jump from higher floors of the building to escape the fire. Many had been prevented by management from using internal stairs to descend or found an absence of fire escapes halted their escape. Several extraordinary images that populated much of the press reporting from the Rana Plaza disaster was that of escaping garment workers, most of whom were women, sliding down a makeshift chute of bright, colourful fabric drawn from uncut bolts of cloth. I'm going to show quite a few images through this talk and just to kind of in warning that some of them I think are still quite upsetting. Some of them I'm going to be showing are, are quite old now, but uh, and most of them are, are cartoons and, gra and, um, and graphics, but they're still quite graphic. So just a kind of warning for that. Of the Rana Plaza disaster, the images glorified by the press show a kind of improvisation a creative variation using the garment fabric to spin new lines out of the building and in the absence of adequate means to do so in the scrumpled or the crumbling structure. As opposed to the evacuation protocols that route their own kind of arrangement of bodies, perhaps as diagrams of power to direct or determine emergency movements, many of which were absent um, in both of the Dhaka disasters, the Rana Plaza escape performed a kind of diagramming, a creative and really and maybe generative potential, what Latham and McCormack could call an eventual creativity, through which women workers and rescue workers improvised to escape the, the disaster, obviously in the face of so many who didn't, and as I'll go on to show, wider, inadequate, restrictive and individualizing urban forms and protocols unable to contain these cre cre these creativities or the kind of the, 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 the sort of germ of some of these creativities. One common occurrence within some of the commentaries, protests and memorial events that followed, including petitions to the US Secretary of Labor, given the complicity of Western fashion brands and household retailers in sourcing garment from these factories, was the evocation of earlier fire disasters in the textile industries of late 19th and early 20th century North America. One such event was the Triangle Ash Shirtwaist waste Factory Fire of 1911 in New York, where 146 predominantly female, characterized by some as just young girls, Jewish and Italian immigrant garment workers were killed, some jumping to their deaths. The fire and the problematic evacuation, which I'll explore in this paper, follows in the footsteps of many other deadly factory fires, including a Newark fire the year earlier, where many young female workers again jumped from high floors, some holding hands. With this in mind, the Bangladesh garment factory disasters might summon a kind of sh shudder, a recurring shudder at a female workforce jumping, seen jumping from high rise buildings. Perhaps we could think about this as a kind of spectral afterlife following Austin Zaderman, who follows Christina Sharp, of gendered and racialized urban labor and urban labor practices and the inadequate buildings that have housed them. E indeed, even in one opera production, ghosts from the Triangle Fire and Rana Plaza disaster even mingle in song at the end, as urban high-rise emergencies seem to endlessly repeat themselves as continuities in the entanglement of capitalist production, the valuation or devaluation of working lives, along with inadequate fire safety regulations and practices, evacuation infrastructures, uh, such as fire escapes. And I'll focus quite a lot on th this kind of, it, these sorts of representations of women or sort of, sort of suspended in flight, if you like. Perhaps fire escape evacuation seems counterintuitive to the ideologies of the kind of masculine ascensionism that is bound up in the history of tall buildings, of the high rise, of what others have called skyscape scraper geographies, but also the minimal amount of work to explore how vertical mobilities might be performed and supported up and down and across these building types as well as the tendency to conceive of the mobilities of vertical evacuation in much more technical terms as problems for engineers and architects or regulators, rather than as social and political and meaningful concerns. Perhaps the worst tendency is to consider vertical evacuation mobility as a kind of common sense, 
And this was recently vocalised by the British Conservative MP Jacob Rees-Mogg in a radio interview in which he suggested that the victims of the Grenfell Tower block disaster in 2017 didn't use what he called common sense to evacuate the building. Rhys Mogg, and he's pictured here in this cartoon by Steve Bell as almost a 19th century industrialist, performs a particular kind of closure which renders evacuation as apolitical, infers that those who followed the advice of police, fire officers and the call operators they spoke to as too stupid to know better, and condescends the social inequalities which put poorer, multi-generational migrant, black and ethnic minority residents within the ordinary verticalities of tower blocks in Britain. He also repeats accusations that were leveled at the shirtwaist garment workers as lacking common sense themselves. While those same very workers and so-called girl strikers would suggest it was mere common sense to industrially agitate, protest and strike. An eruption of a long and smouldering volcano explained garment cloak worker, journalist and activist Teresa Malkiel. For John Preston, the history of stay put instructions for working class minority rock pop communities occupying residential <laughs> high rises in Britain has operated as a form of high rise containment and individuation, pathologizing the mob mobilities of poor working class bodies and relied upon a probabilistic eliminationism in which disadvantages he writes in terms of language, mobility and resources would make certain groups of individuals more likely to follow the stay put advice. Many of the residents of the Grenfell Tower Block had been given far more ambivalent guidance in which evacuation was actually conditional and based on the judgment of the resident or if it was their wish to evacuate. This has the effect, suggests Preston, of placing responsibility for survival upon the individual while requiring the cultural capital necessary to do so and having the resources and capacity to get out. So this paper explores how class, gendered as well as racial prejudices that imbued vertical governance in the form of factory regulations and fire escape design produced but were additionally escaped by the urban subjects that they presumed to know, stereotype and deem culpable. The paper attempts part of a more expansive genealogy of fire escapes which would take more seriously a gendered and raced politics of mobility and mobility injustice, to use Mimi Scheller's terms, bound up in vertical evacuations. This is captured in the figures of the fallen garment worker, the so-called fall girl, whose diagrammings, their embodied creative movements, but also tight coalitions with other workers exceeded their expected responses. But they might present a glimpse of a more embodied feminist alternative to make high rise escape otherwise, and perhaps also to make steps towards thinking about commoning mobilities or the kind of agonistic nature between mobilities and solidarities. And what I wanted to do, the way I wanted to kind of organize the rest of the paper is to sort of take two different cuts, two different ways of looking at the shirtwaist triangle fire. Okay, so sort of failing falling. So as discussed in numerous histories and biographies of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, the fire starts on the eighth floor of the Ash Building from an oil rag bin on the cutting room floor. 146 workers are killed, most of whom are female, and in their late teens and early 20s. Under 100 are killed jumping or falling from the building, and the rest are burnt or suffocated within. Attempts to narrate the disaster seem to draw upon an inability to rescue the garment workers from their passionate inclinations to fall. Women perhaps being more central to submissive falling urban narratives expressed within wider cultural representations aligned to tropes of morality, sexuality and poverty within the city. For many commentators on women's exposures to the Victorian and Edwardian city, fallen women encoded feminine urban autonomy with narratives of an inescapable downward mobility. When women ventured from a respectable homes into the city, writes Nicoletti. And indeed suicide, right, explains Nicoletti, became a remedy for dishonor, self-destruction becoming a means for a generally passive woman to protest or at least abandon, I'm quoting here, her subordinate position in the patriarchal system, a kind of crumbling of agency, suggests Edwards. <laughs> 
While later readings of the vertical city would cast it as male, as seen in Dol Dolores Hayden's exploration of the skyscraper as a kind of rape, which aligns the visual symbolism and felt impressions of the city thrusting upwards as an expression of male reproductive and sexual virility, what she calls a kind of procreant power. At the Ash Building, a single fire escape ended in midair on the second floor. The doors to the factory floors had been locked in order to stop the women workers taking informal breaks and to prevent their movement between floors. The control of mobility in and out of the building was key to the employer's often pernicious organisation of labour and movement. A story in the Ladies' Garment Worker and Union newsletter uh, described the cold, arduous lines of waiting workers being checked by a single person, a checker, in order to punch their time cards, finding them, finding them even if the long queue Late. About of those on the floor were trapped. Some made it to a fire escape that lacked a drop ladder to take them to the ground and it buckled and collapsed. While by 1911 almost half the factory and garment workers in New York were working above the seventh floor in loft factory spaces where light was plentiful. Now what I wanted to move on to talk about in, in more detail was some of this Brown Brothers photography where we saw these twisted um, shapes uh, and distorted shapes of the fallen garment workers uh, on the on the side work as well as some of the broken bits of the building and we see some of the passers-by kind of looking up uh, and some there's some interesting commentary on these on these images particularly from Ellen Wiley Todd who talks about the ways that these individual bodies seem to kind of dwell together as the fabric undulations of their clothing kind of blend one body into another uh, and, and she talks about how this kind of shows bodies as nothing more than bundles of skin, whilst another reporter writes in the New York Times that it was hardly possible to call them bodies because that word suggests something human. So these photographs can help us understand or get some way into a kind of visual and gender politics embedded within the representation of the young women in the disaster. Different levels of male authority document the processing of bodies on their way to the morgue, uh, presented almost as kind of caring, tending actions. The images further perpetrate a silencing of, of, the, of the working class women who had already endured so much to voice the poor and labour and working conditions of the factory in a strike that had only ended the previous year, but they were not permitted to adequately contest the structural inequalities and material impediments that prevented their safe evacuation, especially given that the strike did not result in union representation in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory. And so it took the, the Triangle fire to lead to significant factory and fire regulation to um, a reform. And so just going from let me do it so pulling out from this image and 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 uh what what we see are other kind of representations of the event that merge photographer photography like this with pseudo photograph and montage like structures of images put together with sketches and maps a synoptic view of washington square park and a street layout and an oblique sketch of grace church the New York Tribune, where this is from, called their own front cover a diagrammatic sketch of the surrounding of yesterday's horror. Whilst other newspapers feature similar imagery, but with labels, arrows and numbered legends, pre-mediating the diagrams used at the later trial. The imagery assigns culpability to the building's owners and the regulators, while the language of the reports tend to construct the workers themselves labelled as unfortunates, as maladaptive victims of their own gendered, social and bodily faults. So very little of the press testimony comes from the surviving garment workers themselves, who in their absence were characterised as migrant others. Those who escaped were claimed to have been foreigners who spoke little English and fled for their homes as soon as they gained the sidewalk, wrote a New York Times writer. Whilst Paula Hyman's tracing of the Jewish community's response to the fire is also revealing of the invisibility of the ethnicity of the Jewish immigrant workers from Russian and Eastern Europe, who outnumbered the Italian workers from within many authoritative narratives and histories of the event. <laughs> 
Even the relationships between the workers were deliberately fractured along ethnic lines as employers deliberately paired workers with disparities of pay to induce alienation. And some started rumours deliberately in order to arouse race prejudice between the working classes. When a garment worker is interviewed, we're also unsure as to their reliability as they are described as swooning at the sight of the bodies hurtling through the air around them. And on coming, uh, and coming to, she leapt from one of the windows herself. The fire codes which regulated the building and the technologies that adorned it tended to work on the assumption that the building's inhabitants were ill-adapted to evacuating. Early fire escapes involved moving parts, wires, gears, pulleys, and what Jennifer Blair calls the mutual and indeterminate affectivity of material bodies, human and non-human, as they move and then transform in time. Fire escape design reflected the belief that the main problem of evacuating a building was the inhabitant themselves, their physical and psychological abilities, their sobriety, and their resulting behavior was highly contingent, suggests Blair, as indeterminately volatile as the fire itself. The worker inhabitant of the building is imagined filled with involuntary, untrained or clumsy motions, even incendiary terror. At the Triangle Fire, the workers' bodies tended to speak through bystanders, elevator operators and other male workers. Gendered, classed and raced, the workers were characterised as girls, nearly all of them Italians, innately passionate and melodramatic. One newspaper describes the women as fugitives. And while the article doesn't finger blame, uh, does finger blame the, the owners, city codes and building expect inspectors, it harbours the conviction that the garment workers were as much at fault for breaking open the windows with what they described as frenzy blows and making a mad rush for the two passenger and two freight elevators. The intersection of their heritage and gender signals what McAvoy has called assumptions around their lack of capacity for survival in the industrial order. Male elevator operators cast as heroes by the press describe a scene of the young Italian girls with their eyes starting from terror while fighting with insane strength and savagery to gain the elevators. Some were said to have screamed for help, making flying leaps into the elevator cars. The descriptions account for a, a dehumanized or animalistic self or selfish self throwing themselves at and clinging to the elevator's barriers. Some with their teeth as described. Apparently some workers died in this violence of escape as dead and mutilated bodies who were not killed by fire, I'm quoting again, but torn to pieces, almost by frenzied human hands. It was a mad fight for life, other reports claimed. The press speculated that it was the way in which the girls tried to leave that killed them, declaring that it is certain that many of the unfortunate kill creatures were killed not by fire, but in the mad trampling of many hundreds of feet, again writes the New York Tribune. The girls become susceptible figures falling into potentials to panic, to harm themselves and each other. The crowd below even catches some of this hysteria. The fire brigade and police horses, Stein's authoritative account of the fire suggests, cannot cope with the blood and the bodies, and they succumb to the atmosphere of trauma, rearing up on their, eye, their hind legs, their eyes rolling, he writes. Okay. So to paraphrase a recent article by Beeston on John, J John Don Passos's modernistic novel Manhattan Transfer, which also pays allusions to the Shirtwaist Fire. The Triangle Fire embodies a number of, of what they call vexed polarities, where it's hard to distinguish between bodies phasing in and out, an individual or a mass, a child or an animal, especially in some of this imagery. And some of these uncertainties spread beyond the event of the fire, but to the inquest, a criminal trial, labour and workplace reform too. At the criminal proceedings, several hundred female protesters, some from the families of the victims, were declared to have rioted in a strange mirror of the actual disaster. The women were once more locked out, but this time from the courtroom, beating on the door murderers whilst the factory owners were ensconced inside. The protesters, unable to control their passions, formed a line, paraded about the corridors, crying and tearing out their hair and waving photographs of those dear to them, wrote a write-up again in the New York Times. While the police then took the factory owners from the courtroom, rushing them to the elevators to escape 
come evacuate from the crowd. When worker testimonies are solicited, the defense attorney taking one worker to task on cross-examination attempts to undermine the reliability of their testimony as an account of her failure to control or quiesce her emotions, suggesting, of course you were calm and collected, you're always calm and collected, are you not? And when she replied, no, I'm not always calm, I wasn't calm then, the judge rebukes her for not answering in a respectful way. John Pratevi has suggested that rage and panic might even be understood as an evacuation of the subject as automatic responses take over. Yet the attribution of panic to emergency mobility is rarely unproblematic, subjecting the panicking body to class, gendered and racial prejudices. Even one of the members of the jury that acquitted the building owners suggested it was an act of God and an act of panic. God did it was the response, an ironic and furious response uh, in the International Socialist Review in 1912. He poured scorn at the outcome and the jurors' words, asking, is it God who traps workers in a blazing factory or buries them in a tomb like mine without providing them with one means of escape? Even Leon Stein's history repeats the panic that seizes the young women into a violent selfish selfishness. Panic-stricken girls, he writes, battle each other on that rickety, terrifying descent. The girls fly into panic, or panic pushes them into flight, according to these narratives. A fire insurer and consultant describes human bundle self-flung to the pavement as a choice to roast in the flames behind. Bridges and chains of stout limbs and bodies are constructed where apparatus does not avail. Those found are tra trapped, doomed like trapped beast in the jungle. And indeed, those, those, uh, those who were trapped were compared by one factory manager to a lot of cattle, an outcome of apparent primal maladaptive vulnerabilities. Or as Laurent Berlant suggests in another form of bodily and effective suggest, uh, excess, we might say that the workers were blamed for their own failing and falling will and body. Okay, so take two. So the disaster was the worst of a long line of garment and factory fires in North America. The Newark factory fire of the previous November the 26th, 1910, had seen numerous female factory workers jumping to their deaths from the higher floors. An extraordinary diagram reproduced in the survey in 1910 suggests the detailed cutaway look of the outside and inside spaces of the factory in one image. The annotations are accusatory, identifying window sash locks which made the windows impossible to open and the distance from the floor requiring the young women to jump onto the tables to reach them. So at first glance, it's easy to miss the drawn figures of jumping, falling young women sketched in different postures and forms of bodily expression of hot desperation, clutching at something, their hair trailing behind, skirts billow in the rush of air, and they are forever immobilized and individualized on a page. Some are impaled on spiked railings below intended to keep the workers and others out, just as they were in the shirtwaist fire. While in the Newark fire, the coroner's jury concluded that the blame could not be pinned again on the factory owners, the accidental death caused by the workers' maladaptive actions. The jury identified an individual worker, Carrie Ro Robrecht, who came to her death by misadventure and accident caused by a fall and not as the result of a criminal act, read the jury. The court's finding was not universally accepted, however. So both fires show an industrial worker whose movements and practices in, in some ways were already rationalized as a material energetic abstraction of productive processes and capital to be found wanting. The labor reformer feminist and suffragist Mary Alden Hopkins found that the workers disciplination to their tasks may have actually prevented them from leaving effectively. As one worker explained, the attentive economy of the factories meant that they were not even aware of the fire until it was too late. While Stein accounts for one woman who punched or clocked out during the chaos of the shirtwaist fire. Valued for their productive yet semi-disposable labour, the female worker is a 
back UE as reduced to an abstraction, a contractor of labor power and append to the machine rather than a complex material construction of biology and culture, suggests McAvoy. A human being, writes one worker, throbbing with the aspirations, ambitions and hope of life. So another way of understanding what was constructed as panic and maladaption is to see the escaping, jumping women and their actions as far more affirmative, to see their sympathetic, to see their, their movements more sympathetically, and to see them as movements drawn by people moving together, not individually, but sharing their fears, touching, coaxing, calming one another in their efforts to escape. As opposed to the diagrams of power that structured their work and that have come to define the drilled body mo bodily movements that have come after the shirtwaist triangle fire in the form of fire drills and disciplinary evacuation exercises that many of us uh, know in modern buildings today, women and the workers diagrammed their exit out of the building very differently. So the Boston Morning Herald uh, Journal remarked and romanticized the tenderness of the workers as three of the girls were reported to have kissed each other in a last farewell before they clasped their arms around each other's necks and together plunge hend foremost to the pavement, again writes the journal. Even while reformers highlighted the inadequate infrastructural provision of fire and evacuation materials, they tend to imagine individual universalizing bodies using them, often in atomistic and asocial ways. Just to add a bit more context to this, the Tenement Housing Commission's official study of New York and Brooklyn in 1900 found that almost a quarter of the houses had no balconies at all, Others had a peculiar system of what they called ostensible fire escapes consisting of a vertical ladder suspended in midair in front of the building. Fire escapes were colonized by the buildings and tenants as living storage and social spaces. And it's hardly necessary to point out that this arrangement could not by the furthest stretch of the imagination be considered a fire escape, read a report sorry, to the commission. And so admonishing the dangerous use of evacuation infrastructure, the commission undermines the ways of life of working people for whom the fire escape could be a form of sociality, space and unstifled breath. Indeed, the segregation practices of the 20th century American cinema and theater even shows how some fire escapes became outside, outside staircases for people of color to reach the elevated crow's nest of segregated seating. What if we were to see the shirtwaist garment workers uh, movements and leaps discredited in order to level guilt as actually efforts to evacuate otherwise that wear away at the atomistic and individualistic assumptions we saw earlier. Derek McCormack has talked about moving bodies, forming shapes together, seething and expanding and contracting in what he calls elemental variations that are excessive of the category of entity. The Newark and Triangle fires see envelopments of body seeking solace and escape. The workers push against the atomistic envelopes of body space or kinospheres and the restricted factory conditions which were regulated in New York City by the volume of factory space rather than floor area. They resist attempts to disperse and isolate the same standing and marching interlocking female bodies that are constituted and symbolized the shirtwaist labor force and their solidarities, which had been on strike only the year before for better working conditions, paid holidays and fixed working hours. Perhaps in, in some respects, echoing some of the human chains I had um, earlier in, in Mauritius and some of the, one of the talks earlier. The linking and joining of bodies by interlocked hands and arms has ob is obviously a potent symbol, but also a constituting act of embodied solidarity in protest, but also in evacuation from fire. Yet almost everything was working against these more solidaristic configurations. Even technology and infrastructure exemplified in the factories, locked doors, defunct fire escapes, and the excessive entanglements of bodies and elements escape a technology used by both the Newark and shirt waste um, responses in the form of the fire department, uh, and particularly the use of the life net. These were used by metropolitan fire departments to catch leaping people trying to escape building fires, but they could not cope with the garment workers 
intimate socialities, pressed together by heat and violence that unravel the structural assumptions of fabric under pressure. Bodies come down with arms entwined, three or four together, complains the New York fire chief. The notion of the fireproof building was partly intended to assuage concerns over so-called fire trap and even man trap structures endemic to tenement, residential and converted factories, timber mills and multi-storey buildings with limited or no means to escape them. High rise emergencies drew upon narratives of masculinity in the form of the rescue of sexually vulnerable recipients of the heroic and masculinized firefighter. Rescue by fire brigades could be a form of sexual subservience, spectacle, and equally a chivalric um, display of courage. The ascendant and vertical technologies that went with urban firefighting and evacuation by rescue even drew on other masculine tropes that were tied to te technological adeptness, from manning and handling ladders to fondling fire hoses and coaxing the feminized steam engines in public shows. And many commentators have suggested that many of the garment workers may have seen these shows on their days off, at, perhaps at Coney Island. Whilst the life nets involved material tensions to produce a, a kind of elastic space permitting a soft landing, in the coroner's inquiry, Fire Chief Croker explained that because the workers jumped arm in arm, hugging and holding hands, they all go in a pile together, he suggested, the nets and the firemen were not strong enough. The evacuees diagram in social and bodily configurations at odds with the assumptions of the life net apparatus and the firefighters that use them. Okay, in the wake of these disasters, the depiction of jumping, falling women has become relatively common. Yet there are unlikely resonances with an earlier portrayal of women in flight as Terry Schneider shows in the representation of Anna's Leap, a slave confined to an attic of a tavern in the District of Columbia, who in 1815 jumps out of the window rather than to face enslavement in Georgia and separation from her family. In much the same way that the Triangle Fire to gather together outrage and concern, Anna's Leap awake, awoke considerable discord over slavery in the United States. And Catherine Yusoff has helped us recognize the racialized an emancipatory lineage of the trope of the falling girl or woman. Both leaps undermine forms of human commodification. The garment workers attempted escape is more collective, even if their embodied solidarities and socialities undermine them. Law, construction materials, building assumptions, rescue practices cannot match the diagrams of the bodies and subjects who evacuate in creative, imp improvisory and intimate ways together. The seething images of clamoring women's bodies of fire and, and smoke or being spun tumbling into the air, falling or, or falling and beating at the locked doors in the triangle shirtwaist fire can read of tragedy and victimhood, but equally as a moment of violence and resistance, of lives coming together in ways that startle commentators searching for culpability within an urban social order, but also that challenged the assumptions of the urban environment that were, were endangering, not protecting the working classes and their capacities to escape. Okay, let me just sort of map out some conclusions to this. So this paper has tried to trace a moment in a, in a kind of prehistory of uh, fast fashion high rise factory disasters of today and attempts to evacuate poorly conceived and unregulated buildings. The paper sought to look back at a historical precursor so often cited as an exemplary of inadequate planning practices and poor labor conditions. Events like the Triangle Fire explicate troubling but persistent gendered understandings of agency and mobility that underpin evacuation planning and mobility today, but also the afterlives of vertical, capitalistic, gendered and racialized labor the fabric of evacuation is entangled in these relations. If the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire continues to form an event from which contemporary urban disasters befalling the working classes are compared, especially around the failures of inadequate or poor evacuation, there are other lessons we might learn from this or the full girl. 
As well as locked doors, inadequate fire regulations, and especially the lack of fire and evacuation infrastructure, the Triangle Fire continues the solidaristic configurations of young women who are deemed as transgressive, as conspiratorial, as animalistic, as panicky, maybe as promiscuous and dangerous to themselves and others. This made them somehow culpable for their inability to survive. And yet they diagrammed away from the disciplinary, cursorial and inadequate assumptions around the building's design and management and even the rescue infrastructures that were used to try to save them. The falling girl or woman was not alone or passive as their capture in diagrams and images suggests, but could be understood as a more plural expression of intrapersonal solidarities and intimate agencies, which young migrant women turned to for comfort, collective strength and survival. And so how might fire escapes and the landscape of vertical buildings better accommodate the ways that we evacuate not alone, but together in more communal social forms? In part, I want to follow these questions more tightly. This is really a beginning through a more expansive genealogy of the fire escape, fire escape design and formulations that still crawl up our buildings and hang their shadows on masonry and sidewalk. How much such histories push back at tendencies to depoliticize urban evacuation and fire disasters as asocial, classed or raced, or simply as a, a fact of common sense. How to question the condescension of the capacities of people to evacuate or not with differing capacities to go against the guidance of authorities? And might the figure of the jumping woman be drawn more ambiguously then? Like the figure of the jumping slave, the act is enigmatic, appearing at once an act of despair and self-destruction and blame. While equally to use Snyder's work, words, perhaps also a gesture of love or rebellion, a story of strength and solidarity, of both fire and escape. And that's where I'll leave it. Thanks everybody.